Our reading, even though this series is going to be focused on Leviticus, our reading is going to come from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, starting in verse 9. Hebrews, chapter 13, starting in verse 9. The words are on the screen behind me. I'll give a few more moments to get there. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. But the bodies are burned outside of the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Well, we're starting a series that I've been itching to do for a while now, but we're not, I say this now, we are not doing all of Leviticus, as fun as that would be. We're not doing all of Leviticus. I'm not even being sarcastic. So several years ago, when I was an undergrad, I took a summer where I was a camp counselor. Imagine 2011-ish Michael Hall. I'm younger. I'm a lot stupider. I'm a lot less, less mature. And I, at this camp, felt motivated that I would begin to try and read the Bible cover to cover. Spoiler alert, it didn't happen. But I did read the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Felt you start at the beginning, cover to cover. And what I experienced when I got to Leviticus was having my mind blown over and over again. The, 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 the surprises and the discoveries I made as I read Leviticus. The number of times as I read these sacrifices and I went, Oh, Jesus did that. Oh, Jesus did that too. As a caveat up front, I am not going to tell you that we need to bring back the Levitical practices. Because almost every single person in this room is breaking several of them. Men, if you've ever trimmed your beard ever once, you're busted. And if any of you are wearing mixed fiber fabrics right now, you're in trouble. None of those hot and polyurethane mixture shirts can't do it. Those will go against Levitical law. We're not here to talk about that. What I want to do every Sunday is this. I'm going to talk about what it meant to the Old Testament people, how Jesus fulfills that as a New Testament promise, and then how we should live as a result and response to that sacrifice. There's always going to be something that we should be doing start this series off, I wanted to read this passage from Hebrews because I wanted to highlight specifically verses 15 and 16. So if you still got your Bibles open to Hebrews 13, go down with me to verses 15 and 16 for just a moment. And we're going to set this series up right. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and share with others, for such, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. This is the point of the series. These two verses. And if you want to add for your reading material, add Romans 12, 1 and 2. We have a spiritual sacrifice to give. But this is the point. But I've got to explain the therefore in verse 15. What is the author of Hebrews talking about? 
Well, he opens from what, I, from what we read earlier. What he opens with is saying, listen, don't get carried away by strange teachings. Well, what are the strange teachings? If you eat meat that is sacrificed on the altar, ceremonial foods, right? So we're not talking about meat sacrificed to idols. We're talking about meat sacrificed on the altar to God, which will be relevant for today especially. It's not going to do anything for you. It has no benefit. It does nothing for your faith. It does nothing for your relationship with God. If you eat meat that you sacrifice to the Lord, if you were to go through Leviticus, you get a priest, you follow all the steps, you make the appropriate sacrifices, you get yourself cleansed ceremonially, ready to approach God, it's not going to do anything for you. That's the strange teaching. Instead, what he tells us is this. We should instead be strengthened by grace. And we have an altar on which the priests of Judaism are not welcome to eat. Now that's important because many of the sacrifices, especially the one that we're talking about today, when you made that sacrifice, a portion of the animal's meat was kept aside for the priests to eat. So the priests did not work. They didn't do normal work. They weren't farmers. They weren't ranchers. They weren't goldsmiths. Their work was to attend to the people in their relationship with God and with one another. That was their sole defining purpose. So how did they get food? Well, some of the sacrifices were left for them to consume. But what the author of Hebrews is saying here is that you and I, as Christians, we have a unique place, an altar, that they are not cleansed enough to eat at. And that altar is where the blood of Christ was shed. He goes on, verse 11, the author of Hebrews says, High priest carries the blood of the animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. So follow me. I'm going to work from your perspective, left to right, imagining the tabernacle. This is the courtyard where the sacrifice takes place. This is where most people can enter if they're ceremonially cleaned. Here is the holy place. Only priests can enter here. And here is the most holy place. This is where the Ark of the Covenant sat. This is where the throne with the cherubim and the wings and all that fanciness. There's only one person who can enter this place. And he can only do it one time of year. It is the high priest on the day of Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement, which we're going to talk about later this month, is only allowed to enter it once, because here in this place with the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence physically dwelt. And if anyone were to enter this place, even the high priest, on the one day he was not allowed to, they would be killed instantly because their sin would overwhelm them and God's holiness would smite them where they stood. So verse 11 of Hebrews 13 is referencing that Day of Atonement, the high priest goes to the most holy place to put blood on the altar, on the Ark of the Covenant, for the forgiveness of sins for all of Jerusalem, for all of Israel. But what he does is he ties this uh, unique thing. But the bodies are burned outside of camp. So when the animal that's sacrificed, the blood that's supposed to come here is sacrificed, it's not sacrificed anywhere in the tabernacle. It's not even sacrificed in the camp, which would represent this room. No, instead, it's sacrificed outside of camp. Because in the Day of Atonement, the sacrificial animal represents the full total weight of sin on the community. And the Day of Atonement is meant to forgive the full total weight of sin on the community of Israel. Blood is brought to the most holy place, but the body is sacrificed not even in camp. It's outside of camp. What about Jesus? Well, he says Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. See, where Jesus had to be sacrificed was not in any part of Jerusalem. It was like a suburb of Jerusalem. Jesus was led outside of the city gates, according to the author of Hebrews, and that signified that this sacrifice took place somewhere else. A spiritual matter was happening so that the total weight of sin on humanity, not just Israel, but all of, all of creation, 
could then be blessed because Jesus was killed outside of the city. So then he tells us, spiritually, we need to go outside the camp. Not literally, but spiritually, we are meant to bear the shame and dishonor of the cross. Because remember, the cross represents the height of shame. For the Roman, to die as a criminal is to die with no honor. Your family name means nothing. Anyone related to or associated with you in any way, you're not going to do business with them. You're not going to talk to them. They're the dregs of society. They're criminal scum. You don't talk to them. For the Jew, to die on a tree, on any piece of wood, like Christ on the cross, means that God specifically cursed you. You are the height of a sinner. And Israel doesn't tolerate sinners. We kick them out. Because Israel would use the shame method. They would, they would not associate with anyone considered to be a sinner in the hopes that the shame and isolation would cause the person to repent and return. But for someone to be crucified means that God has cursed them. There's no coming back from that. That is the height of shame of the cross that as Christians, we are meant to bear. All of that leads then, therefore, to verses 15 and 16. We don't have anything to do with the sacrificial system of the Old Testament anymore because as we will see over the coming weeks, Jesus fulfills all of it. We don't need to sacrifice an animal. I don't need to go to my in-law's farm, find a young cow without blemish, drag it to a priest, and have it killed. Christ has paid it. So instead, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices, which comes in the form of our words of worship and praise, and it comes in the form of the actions that we do, the way that we love one another, that we care for one another, that we lift each other up so that we don't suffer. This is why I want to do this series. What I want to do is this. We're going to go to Leviticus for the next five weeks, all of September. While we're in Leviticus, we're going to learn what the sacrifice meant to the Old Testament. We're going to go to the New Testament. We're going to see how Jesus fulfills it. And then we're going to see how we can still participate in that sacrifice spiritually. Not physically, but spiritually. With that said, let's go to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 3 specifically is where the fellowship offering is recorded. And there's a portion in Leviticus 7 that explains a little bit more from the priest's perspective. But I'm going to focus on Leviticus chapter 3. And specifically, I'm going to read the first five verses. Now, what I'm about to read is going to sound incredibly dull and incredibly dry. This is just practice in language style that we are not comfortable with or used to. Do your best to still pay attention. Listen to how the words are phrased and the type of offering God is asking his people to bring. And hopefully that can elicit your imagination to get you to think about how we might spiritually fulfill this. So Leviticus chapter 3, starting in verse 1. If your offering is a fellowship offering, and you offer an animal from the herd, whether male or female, you are to present before the Lord an animal without defect. You are to lay your hand on the head of your offering and slaughter it at the entra entrance to the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's sons, the priests shall splash the blood against the sides of the altar. From the fellowship offering, you are to bring a food offering to the Lord, the internal organs and all the fat that is connected to them, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins, and the long lobe liver, which you will remove with the kidneys. Then Aaron's sons under burn it up on the top of the altar, off, burnt offering that is lying on uh, the burning wood, which is a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Now, I would encourage you to read the rest of this, but the rest of this is other animal options to complete this sacrifice. Because not everyone can afford a cow. Cows were expensive animals. They were a sign of wealth. One, some of these offerings as we go through will offer a dove instead of a cow. That's still significant to even a poor family to have access to a dove. But, Let's stop here. What do we see in this text? Go back to verse 1. With, we'll walk through it. 
If your offering is a fellowship offering, first, what we will see with all of these sacrifices, with the exception of the Day of Atonement, these are not a part of any festival or prescribed time. This is an offering the participant chose to bring. That's the most important thing. This is not done out of obligation. God has said, this is an offering that you can do, a type of worship that I will accept, and you can do it when you feel ready. What times would someone bring a fellowship offering? Well, first, we w- they would bring it to reaffirm and celebrate their covenant relationship with the King of Heaven. God set up his relationship with the Old Testament Israel. I'm going to use a really big word, and I'll explain it in a minute. Like a suzerain vassal treaty. A suzerain vassal treaty, the suzerain is the king, the powerful country. So imagine... Imagine, um, let's say America takes over Canada. It seems really simple because we don't really hate Canada. Let's say we take them over. But instead of conquering them and making it America and we get all those states, we say, listen, Canada, we're going to offer you protection. We're going to offer you like some sort of street name in the world stage. We're going to offer you uh, maybe some financial benefit, security, all of these different things. If you swear to be our loyal subjects, if you serve us faithfully, if you are obedient to our requests and demands, we make them. That's a suzerain vassal treaty. So God, the king, makes a treaty or a pact or a promise or a covenant with Israel, his followers. And one of the options for the fellowship or the peace offering is to bring it to God to reaffirm your commitment to that covenant that you signed. You're saying, God, I want to reaffirm your protection, your blessing, your kindness, your love, your generosity, and the history of all those things that you've done for my forefathers. I'm reaffirming all of that. At the same time, I'm reaffirming my obedience, my trust, my gratitude, and my faithfulness to your word. This is one way in which we would approach the fellowship offering. On the other hand, the fellowship offering can also be used when you want to restore a relationship with another person. Because the fellowship offering is also a feast offering. If you go to the temple and you make a fellowship offering, everyone who's there with you is invited to a party. And after the burnt offering offered to God... You gather everyone there around and you have a feast. Because the peace offering is not a peace offering just between us and God. It is also a peace offering between one another. And this party would last for you to have this feast to restore these relationships and participate in all of this. This is the purpose of the fellowship offering. To signify God's fulfillment of a promise or the reestablishment of your own commitment to that promise or to restore a relationship between people. And they can be at the same time. The other thing I want to point out, if we go back to Leviticus for a moment, so we've talked about what the fellowship offering is and how you offer it. I want to point out another thing. First, the animal that you bring is without defect. And... What you offer God is not the whole animal, like we'll see when we cover the burnt offering. Instead, you offer uh, the internal organs and all the fat, the kidneys, the liver, and the lobe liver. You offer all this stuff. This is considered, historically, the best part of the animal. You're taking the animal and you are offering the best of the best of the best to God. And when you burn that offering to the Lord, that is a food offering to God. That is a need to eat. But in essence, by burning that, you are inviting God to your fellowship offering feast that you are about to participate in with your fellow Israelites. And God finds that to be a pleasing aroma. So this offering was considered a high sacrifice. You were offering the best of what you had to God. You were not holding anything back. You're not withholding 
your best and offering something else. You are bringing the best of what you have. Remember Cain and Abel. Cain's sin was not that he brought crops instead of an animal. There's a grain offering that we're going to cover. Cain's sin is that he brought some of his crops, while Abel brought the firstborn of his livestock, the best of the best, the most important. And so God looked on favor with Abel's sacrifice, but not on Cain's, because Cain withheld the best. He kept that for himself. He did not offer that to God. When we sacrifice, when Israel sacrificed, you are meant to bring your best, all of what you have to offer. David himself said it best, a sacrifice should hurt. It should cost me something. There was a time David wanted to make a sacrifice to the Lord, King David, and he was going to purchase the animals from someone he was, from a farmer he was nearby. And the farmer's like, I can't just take, you should take my animals. I'll give them freely. You're the king. And David said, no. A sacrifice should cost me something. I should have to give something up to God. How am I making a sacrifice? There's a story in the Old Testament of someone who offers a fellowship offering, and that is Hannah. If you want to read her story, read the first two chapters of 1 Samuel, at least up to verse 12 of chapter 2. But 1 Samuel starts like this. There's a lot of conflict happening within Israel. We're nearing the end of the time of the judges. If you remember, the judges were prophets and military leaders at the time when Israel had no king. Samuel was the last of the judges. His mother Hannah was barren at the time, though. And while her husband, Hannah's husband, loved her more than his other wife, his other wife had kids. So societally speaking, at the time, she had more value. But the second wife was jealous of the affection and attention that their husband gave to Hannah. And so she mocked and belittled Hannah relentlessly to make her feel bad because the second wife was jealous. And Hannah went to the Lord and begged and pleaded, God, please give me a child. If you would give me a child, if you would, to to use the phrase, open my womb, I will offer my first child to be dedicated in service to you for the rest of his life. God answers that prayer. He fulfills that commitment. And so what Hannah does is she dedicates Samuel. Let me read to you. This is 1 Samuel chapter uh, chapter 1, verse 21. Let me catch you up real quick before I read this. So we just talked about the fellowship offering. Talked about what it means, when you offer it. And now what I want to do is read this story to give you a concrete example of when it was used. Free, not at a specific time, not because of a specific event, but because Hannah was thankful and wanted to make this sacrifice and offer so that there would be peace and to celebrate that peace and that fellowship with God. So 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 21. When her husband, Elkanah, went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live Always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy, young as he was, along with a three year old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as I surely as you may live, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. I pray that this child, for this child, the Lord granted me what I asked him, so now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and he will worship the Lord there. The three-year-old bull the flower and the skin of wine, with the elements of a fellowship offering. She was going to celebrate the promise fulfilled by God. And now she was also making good on her promise. 
reestablishing the fellowship and a thanksgiving offering that happened. Now that's the Old Testament. That's the fellowship offering from Israel's perspective. Remember, all of these offerings, except for the Day of Atonement, are done freely when the person feels the time is right to make this offering. Much the same way for driving down the road, you turn the radio on, a worship song comes on, and you just start singing. Freely giving at a time that you are struck by the desire to praise and worship the Lord. That is when these offerings are all made. With the exception of the last one, which we'll talk about at the end of the month. Now, let's talk about how Jesus fulfills this. First of all, today is Communion Sunday, which is why I'm doing them out of order and starting in chapter 3 instead of chapter 1. But communion represents a fellowship offering that Christ himself established before his death. Because the purpose of communion is a reminder every time we take of it that we are recommitting to the new covenant in Christ's blood. When we take communion, we are in essence telling God we are recommitting. We are promising again that we want to be obedient, faithful, to love one another, and to follow all of the commands and the precepts of God by our own choice. When it comes to the commands all throughout Scripture, there's certainly an element of obligation. There is an obligation to uh, be peaceful, to be faithful, to show kindness, to not murder or kill or steal or be jealous or gossip. These are commands. But it is inappropriate, even in the Old Testament, it is inappropriate to approach God because you have to. To approach God because you have to undermines the entire relationship God desires to have established with his people. Listen, the new covenant still exists similarly to the covenant Israel was under. This suzerain vassal, this king, and this uh, follower relationship. We are still followers of God. He is still our king. That's not changed. But God does not want us to approach him because we have to. Any more than I want my kid, any more than I want Judah or Audra to apologize to each other because I made them. It's good. It's good to make them practice. But I'd rather that apology be authentic. Something that they recognize I did wrong and I want to apologize. Or that my son does something for my wife because he was just struck in the moment that, hey, I want to do something for mom. So I brought her a gift or I cleaned the dishes or I did this stuff and I wasn't asked to do it. I wanted to do it because I want to love her. This is how, even in the Old Testament, Israel was expected to approach God. And so when the fears and concerns of legalism come up, it's important to remember we should always approach God because we get to, not because we have to. So, the Lord's Supper, which we get to have, we get to partake in, is us choosing willingly to say to God, I want to recommit and be obedient, because I get to, because I get to be obedient. In the same way that the Old Testament people would have offered the fellowship offering, because they get to approach God, and they get to reestablish their covenant relationship with Him, and they get to have a feast with one another, we approach the Lord's table similarly. This is our fellowship offering that Christ established. The other thing that Christ's sacrifice did is that it brought us actual peace. And when we participate in communion, when we are obedient to Christ, when we are sacrificing willingly to God through our actions and through our praise, we are participating and enjoying the peace that Christ brought us. Romans 5.1, Paul says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we put our faith in Christ, when we trust the work that he did, the sacrifice that Christ made brings us peace. It establishes that relationship permanently. The 
flaw with the Old Testament sacrifices, and I say flaw loosely, I don't mean to say that God gave a bad command, but the flaw is that Israel had to bring animals. So a creature bought a creature, brought a creature to cover the sacrifices, or to cover the sins and problems of the first person. This is incomplete. It would never totally cover the sins that we committed. Christ and his death and resurrection has, which is why you and I do not have to bring animals to an altar and don't have to get covered with blood on a weekly basis. Praise the Lord, because I'd have to drown myself in it to cover my own sins. I wouldn't even begin to get to yours. But God set up Christ to be the perfect sacrifice, and so now we just have peace. We just have it. If you are a Christian, if your faith is in Christ, you have peace. There's no need to go to an altar weekly, daily, monthly, whatever, and make this peace or fellowship offering. You don't have to, because Christ has paid it all. Christ with his sacrifice, has given everything to us. And that is how he has fulfilled the peace offering. Just by simply his death and his resurrection has just brought peace. And we have that now. That's it. That's all there is to it. We have peace. So, what do we do? How do we sacrifice a fellowship offering in our daily lives? So while we have communion here as an example of a fellowship offering... This is an example, and this is a fellowship offering we will take place in. This is not a sacrifice that we are doing. We are simply enjoying the feast of the Lord. So what do we do? I think we need to take Jesus' words from the Beatitudes seriously. Blessed are the peacemakers. I think if we want to sacrifice a fellowship offering, we should sacrifice a fellowship offering by bringing peace wherever we go. Whether that's resolved conflicts, whether that's uh, helping someone become established. If you know someone is going through emotional or physical trouble, maybe you go to their house and help them out, make them meals, bring some stability to their life by just taking some of the burden off their shoulders. This is how we can be making the sacrifice or offering a fellowship in our daily lives is just by being peacemakers. It's important to remember where we all started today so we don't forget. As we read from Hebrews, we are called to make sacrifices through our obedience and we are called to make sacrifices through our worship and praise. When we declare the goodness of God to one another, we are sacrificing. And when we show loving kindness and grace to one another, we are sacrificing. So while we will not bring cow or a lamb or a goat or anything like that, please don't bring it here next week. I will not kill it for you. I don't even know where to begin. We don't do that anymore because Christ has covered that with his sacrifice once and for all. We don't have to shed blood anymore. Christ's blood has been shed. So now we should sacrifice spiritually. And what I want to challenge you in is be a peacemaker. If you know someone who's struggling with illness or financial instability, maybe literally bring the feast to them. Bring them a meal. Sit with them. Listen to them. Care for them. Pray for them. If you have a conflict with someone today, I ask you, please go home. and Do everything you can to resolve it. Don't let it wait. Don't let unresolved conflicts dwell in your life. Do everything you can to resolve them peacefully. To make the best situation that you can. And if you can't, whether because that person is inaccessible or the situation is far more complicated than a simple argument, then I ask you to be a peacemaker by praying for that person. We are called by Jesus to pray for our enemies. So pray for the people that you're having a fight with. If you can't resolve the conflict today for whatever reason, pray for them. And pray earnestly for them. Pray for their well-being. Pray for their health. Pray for their financial stability. And pray that possible. By doing this, we will be taking Christ's peace into the world and sharing it with people who desperately need it. And through this, we will make an offering to God that will be a pleasing aroma. 
don't have to burn anything at the altar anymore. God is satisfied with our obedience and our faithfulness that we choose to participate in. And that, that's where I want to leave. If you are not there to where you feel confident that you would choose to do good, and it's more of a sense of obligation that you have to do good, spend time in prayer with God. Ask Him to change your heart, that you would move away from a sense of duty and obligation towards a sense of gratitude and, and joy in serving the Lord. That everything that you do is done because He brings you joy and you want to bring others joy. With that in mind, let's close in prayer and approach the Lord's table for our offering today. Heavenly Father, we want to come to you and we just want to say thank you for peace. Lord, as we look at Leviticus, as we look at our Old Testament, and we look at what you established so long ago, will you help us to find creative ways to continue to make those offerings before you today? Whether that's resolving a conflict bringing peace and stability to someone's life by serving them and caring for them. Lord, whatever it is, will you show those opportunities to us that we can do it, that we can participate, that we can make it happen. Lord, as far as it is concerned with us, may we be faithful in resolving our conflicts. And to the point where if the other party says no, Lord, will we be okay to surrender that to you? Make our hearts willing Father, we just ask that you would continue to be with us. As we gather here today, we gather in your presence here in a moment to enjoy Holy Communion. May that recommitment to your covenant be real. May we be convicted of any sin that gets in the way of serving you. May we be faithful and joyous in our sacrifices to you. And ultimately, Lord, may you bring us peace a peace that is so overflowing that we just can't help but want to share it. Thank you, Father. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Looks like to start with uh, Holy Communion, we have a couple verses.